because of the rise of BGP in the wake of Narendra Modi. Uh, the 2019 elections are even more significant. You see that upper caste uh, MPs uh, represented more than 36% of uh, the BGP MPs uh, and OBCs less than 19%, uh, which, is, which is very uh, significant. And the, and, the, and the 2019 government, Modi government, is even more dominated by upper caste. Uh, more than 46% uh, of the ministers uh, come from the upper caste in uh, today's government of India. One more explanation is needed, though. It's not only because of um, the Hindu nationalist populist uh, leader that OBC politics has been countered. It's also because of what I call the neo middle class phenomenon. And, and that has also something to do with uh, Modi's uh, strategy. Narendra Modi attracted OBC voters, not only as Hindus, not only because of their, um, you can say, um, Sanskritization uh, process, but also in the name of the neo middle class. This idea is very much there in Gujarat in the 2012 elections, when for the first time Narendra Modi uh, makes this concept uh, a political tool. Uh, he says, we have now created a new class, a class of emerging people, uh, people who are aspiring. Most of them have migrated from the village to the city and they have benefited from the double digit growth rate. They are in the process of being empowered and they are empowered in, in terms of class, not in terms of caste. So one identity, the new middle class identity is submerging uh, caste identities and caste politics. Mind you, of course, uh, this discourse uh, in terms of class has no affinity with socialism. On the contrary, uh, instead of asking for more equality and redistribution, uh, the, um, no, the, the notion of merit uh, is, is key. So uh, social justice is not based on redistribution, but on access to jobs. And uh, in 2014, of course, one of the major uh, promises made by uh, Narendra Modi was jobs for everybody, including, of course, uh, the aspiring groups coming from the uh, neo middle class. So this discourse, um, was of course a kind of antidote, uh, this repertoire was a kind of antidote to uh, positive discrimination. Uh, it's not a, a policy that goes in favor of uh, redistribution, support for the weak, those who need help. It's a repertoire based on merit, based on hard work, as, as you may remember, Narendra Modi also said that hard work is, for, is better than Harvard. Uh, that's part of the same repertoire. Incidentally, this discourse has gradually become hegemonic um, after the 1991 reform. And, and Congress uh, had always kept this repertoire on a par with positive discrimination. Uh, so parallel to Mandal II, the UPA government uh, promoted, of course, also this, uh, you can say, neoliberal uh, repertoire. Third, it's not only because of its enemies that OBC politics has lost some of its relevance. It's also because of its uh, own weaknesses. And I would like to dwell on this, um, especially if on your agenda is the idea of how can we renew um, the OBC politics of yesterday, or can we relaunch uh, this um, agenda? Well, first of all, there is a kind of mechanical 
decline of OBC politics after each and every state, in addition to the center, introduced the famous 27% quota. Because you reach a saturation point because of the judiciary. The judiciary made a point not to have the total amount of reservations going beyond 49%. So no party could say, vote for me and you'll get reservations. You'll get more reservations. Technically, it becomes impossible. And after you have reservations, not only in the um, public sector for jobs, but also uh, in the universities, uh, it's very difficult to, to mobilize OBCs on, on a, a, a motto like this one, vote for me, you'll get reservations because what is the frontier? The frontier is the private sector. And how can the government, how can any party promise reservation in the private sector? That's, that's a different um, kind of... Um, oh, oh, I think... Yeah, someone... Uh, yeah, James. Don't do anything with this. It's it's you know, stop chain is screening. Sorry. Is that fine now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So that's one one of the weaknesses of OBC politics. You know, the judiciary, and and we could return sorry, to this. To share the screen. I'm sorry. You need to stay, share the screen. I I thought I was. You 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 don't, you don't, you're not seeing my screen anymore. No, sir. Can't, can't you see my screen? No. Ah, uh -uh. so let me start it again. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Yeah, we are able to see. Yeah. Okay. So the other weakness of OBC politics has, of course, something to do with the unequal uh, benefit that some judges got from reservations compared to others. Uh, this is a very important point because it explains why some OBCs did not look at reservations as the best policy for them. Uh, it's one of the reasons why OBCs remain so divided and divisions within OBCs uh, is very similar to uh, divisions within Dalits and for the same reason. Let's have a look at the, the Yadavs. Uh, Yadavs of Uttar Pradesh. And the case of Yadavs in, in BR is, is different. We may return to it if you want uh, in the Q&A. But uh, the case of uh, the Yadavs in, in Uttar Pradesh has been well captured by the Indian Human Development Survey and the last round of the survey is a bit old, unfortunately, 2011, 2012. Uh, but still, uh, it showed that reservations had made some impact because the reservations were already 20 years old, even more than that uh, in 2011, 2012. And reservations had got the Yarab side in, in large numbers. 14.5% of the Yadavs occupied a salary job in 2011, 2012, against 5.8 for the Kurmis and 5.7 for the Telis, 6.7 for the Kushwahas, 3.5 for the Lodis and so on and so forth. Clearly, the first beneficiaries of reservations were Yadavs. Um, and that's why some people could speak of some Yadavization of Uttar Pradesh under Mulayam Singh Yadav, under the Samajwadi party. Samajwadi party took over in 89 and could rule uh, for a um, full term and uh, recruit um, Yadavs in, in the police, uh, for instance, in many different parts. So this idea that some Jatis, OBC Jatis, benefit more than others from reservations, created some resentment. 
and some divisions. And in BR, we could see another OBC Jati, Kurmiz, uh, seceding from um, the Janata Dal, creating uh, the GDU. Uh, anytime you secede, you have a united in your name, paradoxically. So Janata Dal United was in fact a breakaway faction of Janata Dal. And of course, the other uh, group was made of um, La Lupra Sardiadav's follower who created the RJD, Rashtriya Janata Dal. Divisions of Jatis resulted along Jatis lines, resulted in political divisions and weakened considerably the OBC movement. But there is more, and let's stick to UP for seeing what more has to be seen. Well, not only some OBC Jatis resented the way Yadavs had established their uh, domination, but the B BGP was very shrewd to nominate candidates from non Yadav Jatis, and in Uttar Pradesh. Kurmis, of course, were uh, among them, in order to consolidate a non Yadav OBC vote and capitalize, to capitalize on the resentment of this caste vis a vis the Yadavs. Let's have a look to what we saw in the 2019 elections. We saw poor OBCs voted more from the B for the BGP than for the BSP SP alliance, in spite of the fact that BGP in Uttar Pradesh is a very elitist upper caste party. So 59% of the poor OBCs supported BGP again 33.5% would turn to the BSP SP alliance because BGP had been shrewd enough to nominate non have poor OBCs or small um, OBC Jati leaders uh, in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, these figures incidentally come from the CSDS Lokniti uh, National uh, Election Survey, that is the most reli reliable one. This attractivity or this attractiveness of uh, BGP vis a vis uh, poor OBCs, small OBC Jatis, um, has to do with something I mentioned before Sanskritization. You know, uh, many caste groups. Uh, were very low um, and small and dominated, uh, find it uh, rewarding to be accepted by the Hindu eye tradition. Something we see on the Dalit side. It's very, very similar with the Balmikis, for instance. This graph that we published uh, on the basis of the Spine Per project with Gilles Veronier in a recent article is very, very significant. For the first time in 2019, the percentage of Lok Sabha MPs in the Indie Belt coming from small OBC Jatis is more important than the percentage of OBC MPs coming from large OBC Jatis. And of course, Yadavs are the big losers. So, we see that one of the weaknesses of OBC politics came from this incapacity to retain uh, unity, uh, partly because of this paradox of reservations. The paradox is some are benefiting from reservations more than others. And as a result, those who do not benefit form a kind of coalition against the leading OBC Jatis. And in the case of uh, Uttar Pradesh, clearly many OBC Jatis wanted Yadavs to lose some of their power. Uh, and, and, and they turned to BGP and BGP was of course very shrewd in, in uh, turning to them as well for this, for this process to, to happen. That's the end for the first part of my talk. And I'd like to turn now to, to the second part, because of course, uh, as I've said in the introduction, 
Mandal was not only primarily uh, for jobs, but still it was an important part of the scheme to make OBCs rich uh, sectors of the bureaucracy, the famous corridors of power that VP Singh had mentioned. And therefore we need to ask ourselves after so many years, after 30 years, has Mandal delivered in terms of jobs, in terms of reservations in the public sector? Well, it took quite some time for quotas in the public sector to be filled. And, and that's something we saw before in the case of uh, scheduled caste. It took something like 40 years for the A group uh, of reservations to be filled uh, in the case of, of, of the Dalits. Well, uh, in the case of OBCs also, uh, some categories are better treated than others. And as you could see on this uh, table uh, that was um, built in 2017, thanks to some RTI activist, uh, the percentage of uh, OBC posts that remained vacant uh, could be very high. Uh, in, uh, in group A uh, in particular, uh, in group B as well. So the percentage of, B, of, of OBC posts to the sanctions, sanctioned post um, was never uh, sufficient, uh, never, never, the quota is, is never fully filled. And, and this is my RTA, that is my RTA. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> it helped a lot. <laughs> I feel happy to see it on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, that was very helpful. You know, you, 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 you rely on these kind of sources. What else do you, what else can you do? So please continue. Uh, I can't fail RTI myself. So uh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So an, another uh, interesting um, uh, set of data is when you look at the representation of OBCs in central government services. And, and we don't have very recent data, by the way. You know, data have become a huge problem. Uh, and post 2014, there are many lacunas uh, in, in the data. So these, these stops, this table, this graph stops in, in 2014. What do you see there? You see that uh, in terms of numbers, uh, the numbers of employees in the central government services. Uh, for the first time in 2012, OBCs have taken over um, SCs, uh, but it took quite a long time uh, for, for this quota, for this uh, number uh, to be reached. Um, and, and in terms of absolute numbers, as you can see, it's not that much, you know, we have 5.83 lakhs of people, uh, which is always something to remember. 27% is never reached, but not only that, uh, even 27% would not mean uh, millions of jobs. Huh? It would not mean that many jobs. And if you look at percentages, which is, of course, what we have to do beyond the uh, absolute numbers, we see that in fact, the percentage of OBCs in the central government services is declining. It has increased, it, it has increased somewhat tremendously between 2004 and, 19, and, and 2013, you know, the, these are the UPA years from 5.29% to 19.75%, multiplied by almost four. We are still far from 27%, yes, but uh, we are on our way. And for the first time in 2014, we saw the percentage of um, jobs uh, for OBCs uh, declining 
to 18.24 percent. The big question is, uh, as the trend continued, and and we just don't know because uh, we don't have the data. Um, well, we have for 2015, in fact, and here you see how you disaggregate the 18 percent I've just mentioned before. Well, uh, the the A group. The A category remains underrepresented. Uh, most of the people, well, a larger number of people, uh, is in the uh, C group in, in uh, the uh, uh, category. Uh, you can say that is number three. If you turn to the um, graph that Com that comes from the table we we've just seen, uh, you see that uh, vi you visualize the fact that uh, in spite of being uh, many more OBCs are not terribly more represented that, than SCs. And they are even less represented than SCs in the A category and B category, which is of course uh, because of history. Uh, serial cast have reservations for 70 years, 80 years, uh, and therefore their quotas have been fulfilled, uh, uh, have been filled up um, more, more, more steadily in the course of time. So uh, you can certainly turn to another dimension that is not, and, uh, and it's important to do it, that is not the uh, central government services, but the central public sector to see what's going on in the companies, in the industry, in the uh, PSUs. Uh, and, and there you see that OBCs represent something like 28.5% represented in 2013, 2014, 28.5% of the um, total jobs Therefore, in that case, the quota is filled up. And, uh, and that's something uh, that uh, started also uh, in 2003, 2004, uh, 10, 10 percentage points were earned, were won over under the UPA government between 2003 and 2004 and 2013, 2014. So this is of course, uh, showing a different picture. The central government services uh, are not as reconforting as what we see in the central public sector uh, and, and mostly PSUs. But, and that's a very important caveat, we are looking at percentages which represent numbers that are shrinking because in the PSUs and in the public sector at large, in the public sector enterprises at large, the number of workers is declining because of vacancies, because of privatization. The number of vacancies is increasing tremendously. 7.5 lakh posts are vacant or were vacant in 2014 in the public sector. And we saw therefore that the percentage we mentioned, 20% plus, represent less people today, 81.93 thousands, than the 20 And even the 16.6% that was there 10 years before. The percentage has increased, the numbers have decreased because the percentage is looking at numbers which are shrinking. So that's a very important point to, to make. Don't be obsessed with the 27% with the magic figures look at how many jobs these 27 persons represent. And, and uh, 
this is of course something you need to do by, by looking at, at the data whenever they become available. Why? Because privatization is reducing the number of jobs in addition to vacancies. And this is something that will probably continue and maybe this uh, process will even gain momentum because I knew, as you may remember in May, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, uh, while she was announcing the fifth and last tranche of the second COVID crisis related stimulus package, told that privatization would now be the order of the day. It was already there in the February budget session. She had said that uh, Air India and the Life Insurance Corporation would, would be somewhat privatized. But um, we saw with this new public sector enterprising enterprises policy, a list of uh, strategic sectors that uh, would be notified. And in these sectors, not more than four public sector enterprises uh, would be uh, allowed. The, the rest would be merged or privatized. So uh, jobs in public sector enterprises will continue to uh, diminish and therefore the quotas will be inevitably mechanically affected. So let me conclude uh, by uh, wrapping up and, and saying, first of all, that, um, well, 30 years indeed, after VP Singh announced the implementation of the Mandal Commission report, OBC politics has lost its appeal. Uh, and it's partly due of the Indra politics, of the neo class politics, but it is also due to divisions of the OBCs along party lines as well as jati lines. And it's also due, as I have just said, to the policies that the state, that the government has followed, um, making, making it difficult for OBCs to get their due. Well, paradoxically, that may the reason why uh, OBCs may mobilize again, uh, because they have not got their due. I mean, the, the jobs are not there. Uh, and uh, even if the quotas are, are filled, uh, the numbers of jobs is, is shrinking. Um, and of course, that would have even more repercussions if dominant caste, including Patels, Jats, Marathas, Kapus, were rec recognized as OBCs. But even if they are not, and, uh, and they may not be recognized as OBCs, uh, the job problems will remain. And, may justify some more new forms of mobilization. Um, that's, that's what the future will say. Uh, I, I will stop there because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to predict the future at any rate. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Jeff Kristo. Um, uh, we'll now go for uh, uh, maybe interaction for some time. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Sadeep Yadav, who is also looking after All India OBC Coordination Committee. Uh, he is touring the entire country on different OBC issues. So over to Sandeep Yadav. Uh, uh, thank you, Kiran. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Christoph Jaffrelak. Uh, but uh, can, I, uh, can he take questions? Yes, of course, please. Uh, sir, uh, this is Sandeep from Del University of Delhi. Actually, I had uh, uh, three questions, uh, basically. Uh, three small questions. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, a very uh, in-depth study about India. And that too about the OBCs, which uh, nobody talks about, nobody speaks for. They are the most marginalized category in the whole country. And unless they evolve, the country could not evolve. And um, you being a, a person uh, placed in a far off country, you have devoted uh, your uh, good, um, you know, you have spent lots of time in researching about India and you have find out the uh, in exact and the correct loopholes, the problems of the Indian society. Uh, first question is, uh, you know, as you talked about the Yadavization in Uttar Pradesh and uh, Bihar, uh, though I'm a Yadav, but uh, 
I uh, take myself as a, an individual. Uh, but, you know, as far as my uh, observation goes about Uttar Pradesh, uh, here uh, the Yadavs uh, are, uh, as per the two, uh, 1930 uh, uh, caste uh, um, census, the population of Yadavs are uh, said uh, 11%. But uh, here uh, we think that they are above 15%, or around 14%, because you know they have a good fertility rate and low mortality rate in uh, rural areas. And the other thing is, uh, like uh, the data which you were sharing, actually they are more in uh, numbers in class fourth, uh, fourth class uh, police uh, department and the primary school teacher job. Uh, if you take that, um, you know, I don't uh, whether I don't know whether you have the data about the class one jobs of Uttar Pradesh or class two jobs of Uttar Pradesh. Um, I do try to get it, but uh, I, we couldn't get the exact data. Uh, but uh, the point is that there are more more in numbers in uh, uh, police jobs and uh, primary school teaching jobs. Uh, they generally qualify in even uh, open category also. So uh, that's why this number has, may have increased but they are still less represented in class one, class two, and good jobs. Like take the example of uh, uh, the vice chancellors in Uttar Pradesh, judiciary, administration, uh, any important uh, positions, they are not. So um, the first question is, uh, like we will have to look uh, about the data. And the second question, sir, uh, like the OBCs, as you said in your presentation, like the OBCs, uh, uh, like the upper caste are uh, around 45% in parliament. So why uh, did the OBC fail to uh, raise this issue that the uh, the upper caste, uh, see, the upper caste means three Varnas, like the Brahmins, Kshatriya, and the Vaisyas. They are eating the share of the uh, the whole, uh, you know, they, they would not be less than, uh, sorry, more than 15%, but they are three times more represented in the parliament, not in uh, class fourth job, not in any attendance job. They are three times more represented. So how, means how, why did and how did the OBC leadership fail to, or even Dalit leadership fail to uh, highlight this uh, issue? And they could have also uh, um, means raised this issue and could have, uh, could have got good mileage in the elections. So this was my second question. And third question, sir, uh, as you said in your uh, presentation, like Narendra Modi, uh, uh, means like the Sangh, uh, uh, Sangh actually high, uh, posed him. Uh, as an OBC icon or OBC face. But, you know, uh, as we know, um, Narendra Modi is not a true OBC. You know, he, he doesn't uh, face any caste discrimination. Like when he became the chief minister of Gujarat for the first time, he comes from a Mod Ghachi Teli caste. And uh, that fellow, I mean, that person, sorry, um, I mean, sir, he included his caste into OBC. Prior to that, he was an open category person. So he doesn't have any discrimination, any, you know, he, he, he may be technically OBC, but he has all his sympathy for the upper caste and he is, you know, working for all the corporates and the upper caste people. So he, now the people, you know, my, my question is that, so if he is not a true OBC, but, you know, he cheated the Indian society, Indian people uh, by... Um, uh, forging an identity of OBC and he's benefiting the corporates who are the Baniyas and the Brahmins. So that is, you know, he's taking the society backward and he's sabotaging, sabotaging, sabotaging the poor people of this country. This is my third question and I want to know your opinion about all this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, excellent questions. I will take them in, this, in, in the same order. Um, yes, there is... Uh, qualification to what I have said vis-a-vis -vis the Yadavs, and I'm glad you asked the question, because you need to disaggregate uh, what is behind a quota. Uh, you may have a, a C-class post, and it's not at all the same thing as having an A-class post. In the case of the Yadavs, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I don't have the disaggregate, I, I can't, go too deep in this direction. But the uh, Indian Human Development Survey helps us because it shows that in spite of Yadavs having a lot of jobs, they are not rich compared to other groups. Let me give you just a couple of data figures, not from UP this time, but 
yeah, BR. And BR is very much in the news, so it's very interesting. You see that in BR, Yadavs had more access to reservations than any other OBC group. And of course, this is probably due to 15 years of RJD uh, domination. But if you look at the, the, the per capita income that Yadavs have, they got 12,314 in the 2011-2012 uh, round, when Kushwa has got 18,811 and Kurumi's 17,835. So Kushwahas and Kurmis earn something like 30% more than Yadavs. It's very important to keep this in mind. By the way, uh, it means that Chamars, Jatavs, earn more than Yadavs in Bihar. So this, you see this disconnect. You may have reservations, but these reservations may, may not give you much in terms of resources. But to have the reservations makes you a kind of target because those who do not have access to reservations can make a coalition against the dominant group. And not only because of reservations, of course, in the case of Yadavs. Yadavs were seen as dominant politically. La Rue Prasad Yadav government in 95 had a huge number of Yadav ministers. So the visibility of the Yadavs on the political scene made them a target. And, and this disconnect is very important. You appear as dominant in spite of the fact that in socioeconomic terms, you're not. And I think we should work on this because it's very important to, to capture the, the imagination of, of, of the uh, non-Yadav OBCs who do not want the Yadavs to rule Uttar Pradesh or OBR. Second question, what has the OBC leadership done? Good question. Good question. What have they done in parliament when they were in such large numbers for so many years? Now they are declining. Now they are on the decline. But they were there in large numbers for many years. You know, what I always found absolutely fascinating was the inability of OBC MPs to join ends across party lines no? for defending the OBC's interest irrespective of party affiliation. One. Secondly, in the party apparatus, except of course Samadvadi party, except of course RJD, uh, you don't find OBCs. The party leaders remain in most of the cases dominant caste people or upper caste people. So for these two reasons, I think uh, they could not push the uh, interest and, and help. Um, well, with a caveat, under the UPA, clearly Mondal II was due to OBC MPs pushing for this um, reservation system to happen in the uh, university system. But otherwise, it was very difficult, uh, and we don't see we did not see them joining hands um, in parliament. Well, last point. Um, of course, uh, I have. It, it's more a comment than a question. <laughs> so certainly, um, we we don't see more than uh, public relations, uh, political marketing. Uh, you know the the Chaivala, um, uh, repertoire. Um, but in concrete terms, uh, we don't see uh, anything for, for OBCs as OBCs. And, and in fact, the fact that Narendra Modi has coined this phrase, a neo middle class, is precisely a way to uh, replace uh, OBC politics by, by something different. So I, I, I can't say more. You have been very, very eloquent uh, on that front.
Yeah, uh, and we'll go quickly to uh, Sri Karnanidhi. Uh, he is also quite active in uh, raising different issues at different levels and also filed a court case in Supreme Court and also in High Court, Madras High Court on a neat issue. Uh, sir, Karnani, sir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes, yes. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you. Okay. Uh, sir, good evening. Good evening. Kiran and Kishtaf, I am very nice to see you and hear about you. And I am reading your uh, regularly your articles also whenever it happens in the newspapers. And uh, we are very much uh, um, thankful to you for bringing out certain um, uh, social issues in, in your uh, in a different perspective, which is still, uh, very helpful to us also. And uh, my uh, my one one question is whether in, in all your uh, articles about this OBC or uh, on social issues, you were mentioning about the uh, uh, North India whether you had any analysis about how Tamil Nadu has worked, how Periyar movement has worked, because that will throw a lot of light in comparison with the other states where Tamil Nadu has succeeded in social front and the other states have failed in that. Whether you had made any analysis of that, that is my one question. Second question is, my view is why this, uh, uh, this kind of um, failure in the social justice front after this um, post mandal era, when that uh, mandal commission came and BP Singh introduced 27% and all this, there is a political mileage, uh, indeed, particularly in UP and Bihar, where the OBC people and uh, uh, SC people were able to have a say in the politics also. They were able to occupy the positions, but they were not able to sustain that. Because my view, my perspective is, because of this, this uh, caste uh, suffixing of the caste uh, in their names, which Peria did uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, all the persons, even though they belong to a different caste, there is no suffixing of uh, the caste in their name. So when, uh, when, when we talk about social justice, even though uh, myself and the other person belong to different caste, we never think about that caste angle. We think it as an OBC angle. Whereas in the North India, particularly in UP and Bihar, it comes out as a yadav or non-yadav issue, which totally uh, uh, makes an impact on the uh, movement of the OBC movement. Whether I am correct in, the, in my perspective, this is the, my major two questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm afraid I will not be able to respond to the first one because of my... Uh, um, yes, bias. <laughs> I, I'm really uh, looking at North India and West India, uh, Maharashtra and Gujarat. Um, I, I'm not at all, and uh, I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the South. But what I would say um, in, in the comparison between the North and the South um, is that um, I do think that in the South, the Dravidian movement, helped OBCs tremendously. Because yeah. as Dravidians, they had an alternative identity. Yeah. They could go out of the caste system and say, we were there first in the, <laughs> after all, we were the um, uh, original people uh, of this land. And uh, they, they, they therefore reversed the hierarchy. Um, you, you were the invaders, you upper caste people have been the invaders, uh, and not only uh, you claim to be superior, uh, but you are also uh, arrogant and aggressive. So I think the identity that Dravidianism gave to Tamils, especially, was the antidote to caste, and 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 helped tremendously. In fact, I do think that uh, Baba Saheb Ambedkar realized this at this intuition when he said, let's convert to Buddhism because that way we'll have an alternative identity to caste-based Hinduism. Uh, but of course that could not work uh, as, as well as, as for the Dravidians. For explaining why um, Dalits and uh, OBCs in North India, that's your second question, um, cannot sustain their, their rise to power 
Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you have a, a good intuition uh, and uh, I'm, I'm prepared to explore it further. Uh, but but let's, let's return to this notion because I think you're very right. They have right, they have reason and then they have declined. You know, we saw that in the past on many occasions. In the late 60s, 67, BR is the crucible of OBC politics. In the late 70s, Karpuri Thakur, again, BR and Uttar Pradesh are very much um, on the rise. And then you have the post Mandal moment. So you have cycles, cycles of um, assertiveness, emancipation, and then they fall back. Why do they fall back? Why, why isn't it sustainable? I, I do think that one of the reasons is um, divisions within these groups. They can't sustain unity for, the, for, for, for many reasons, including the ones I've just mentioned. And secondly, uh, the strategies of upper caste dominated parties who are always very good at divide and rule co-opting also uh, those who are for sale. And so many people have no commitment to the cause, but are happy to be to get some kursi, uh, some seat, some portfolio. Um, so all, uh, and last but not least, never forget that in Indian politics, money plays a huge role. And none of these parties, can compete vis-a-vis -vis the big, the rich, dominant parties. So for all these reasons, uh, I think uh, the sustainability issue has been, has been recurrent. Yeah, and we have with us uh, uh, Sri Surya Rao uh, Sangam, who is uh, active in this uh, uh, most back of cast movement. So over to Sangam Surya Rao. Oh, one minute. Hello. Yeah, my Yeah. Sir, my question is how most backward classes, MBCs, can become politically vocal and push for their demands, sir. Please. Well, Hello, listen to the word, sir. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Sir, good evening, sir. Yeah, I could hear your question. The 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 MBCs How question. Classes, MBCs. Yeah. Can become politically vocal and push for their demands, please. Well, th this is always the same story. Um, first of all, you need to build so much unity. So you you need to appear so much unit united that you can uh, promote uh, your um, community as a vote bank. You know, that's, that's the uh, usual uh, detour uh, in India. You have to, to first of all appear as, as a vote bank. Uh, it's more difficult for MBCs possibly because they have less resources. But I must say the division of OBCs between OBCs and MBCs, uh, especially in BR, has been one of the best ways for um, making sure that reservations are not cornered by dominant OBC jatis. And therefore, it may take a longer time, but, but, but they may benefit in the long run. I think it's much more convincing than the creamy layer arrangement. The creamy layer arrangement uh, is, is not as effective as a division of OBCs between OBCs and MBCs. Yeah, we have with us Professor uh, E. Venkateshu, who is a professor in Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. So, Professor Venkatesh. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, happy to uh, interact with uh, Christopher Zephyrle, who has captured, uh, conceptualized the uh, rise of uh, OBC identity in Indian politics as uh, the rise of Libyans and the social revolution. So at least I have two or three questions. 
first one is that uh, silent revolution that has produced the reservation policy, whereas the counter revolution that has produced the OBC prime minister may not be emerging from the OBC uh, identity. At least the RSS BJP has created their own OBC prime minister and uh, Narendra Modi claimed he is the OBC 2014 elections and 2019 elections as MBC. So can we look at it as a choice of the OBCs to reserve whether they want a reservation or a prime minister position? So that is the one question. And second is that we have seen that statistical data has been revealing that 27% of the reservations has never been implemented and not benefited. But on the other hand, there has been a contradiction between OBCs and MBCs. So rise of these MBCs, whether we should look at it, uh, it is a damaging to the consolidation of the OBC identity or is it uh, for the or is it benefiting of the Bharti Janta Party or whether the OBC, whether MBCs has got any benefit at all from this uh, MBC identity formation. So we have known this uh, Uttar Pradesh experience, the social engineering process. Uh, uh, Bhajan Samaj Party always trying to attract the upper caste vote bank, whereas Bharti Janta Party social engineering for the attracting of the lower caste vote bank, that is how it has uh, got benefited uh, immensely. Uh, that is the uh, uh, one question. And third one is that uh, in the context of uh, uh, privatization, as you said, you rightly said that uh, the percentage has been increasing, whereas the number of the people who are supposed to uh, present in the public sector has been declined in the frustration. Is it going to that frustration? Is it the outcome of the MBC or is it that outcome, that frustration? Is it going to turn into the uh, shaping a new alternative politics or rise of uh, social revolution two, phase two, or something? How do you predict uh, this in the wake of uh, that available data? These are the my three questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, the first question is more a remark, and I fully agree with, with the remark, but your two questions, the two other questions are, are, are um, definitely very interesting. Yes, uh, divisions between MBCs and OBCs could be at the expense of equality uh, and equality-oriented policies if you use the MBCs against the OBCs. And that's what I suggested when I said that um, BGP was very good at nominating candidates from the poorest um, OBC caste in order to fight uh, the, the Yadavs um, in, in Uttar Pradesh and, and, and BR especially. Yes, that's, that's definitely a, a caveat. Um, divisions can be um, used politically um, in a negative manner, uh, in spite of the fact that they may be useful uh, for socioeconomic objectives. Yeah. The privatization issue uh, indeed uh, takes you to this question about, um, well, how can the uh, Mandal moment be resurrected? How can uh, mobilization be um, relaunched. Um, how can I predict that? Of course, I don't know what will happen, but definitely the non fulfillment of socioeconomic objectives can result in more mobilization. Will it be along caste lines? Will it be uh, much more along class lines? Um, that, that's something leaders uh, will will know better than me will decide uh, social movements can sometimes be more massive if they ignore uh, caste visions for instance but if i had to predict something i would certainly predict that the inequalities the gaps between the rich and the poor um, may at the end of the day uh, result in something new, not along the lines of the uh, Mandal movement, but with a very similar so philosophy, uh, at least uh, um, the VP Singh uh, motto regarding uh, the need for empowerment. Yeah, uh, 
we have with us Ashwant. Uh, you want to ask? Ashwant is from uh, this Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, Ashwant, are you there? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, this is Yashwant here. Uh, uh, sir, uh, as you have mentioned, ki Mandal politics is not about job. and But we have discussed the entire framework of your uh, presentation, how this has been got benefit out, out of this policy. So I just wanted to understand whether this OBC politics is about only reservation benefit or it has a larger meaning uh, to this politics. And the way Dalit politics has a larger meaning uh, towards the humanitarian values. In that context, how do we see this OBC politics? And the second thing is, uh, as you have presented the case study of uh, Hindi Belt, uh, what, uh, in a similar way, what kind of changes you have uh, observed in state of Maharashtra in terms of representation at MP, uh, MLA level, and uh, uh, any other uh, observation in terms of getting benefits of job and education of various uh, OBC cars belongs to Maharashtra. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, this question of um, jobs is, is very important. When I say Mondal was not about jobs, I, I just mean to say that the idea was not to create a mass employment scheme because reservations are not for um, the masses. I mean, it's not a redistribution plan. And it's true for Dalits as well. Uh, the idea or, or Adivasis, the idea with positive discrimination is to create some elite, some avant-garde in a community. An avant-garde that will be in a position to lobby the state, that will be in a position to be in the corridor of power, to use VP Singh's words. So a role model also, and uh, that's exactly what Ambedkar has been. Ambedkar has been a role model uh, for, for so many others. A role model on the one hand, a lobby on the other hand, but not a massive number. So that's the philosophy behind positive discrimination everywhere in the world. Maharashtra is not, is not very much on my, on my uh, radar screen. But what we found when we did research uh, and published a book called Rise of the Plebeians, uh, co-edited by me and Sanjay Kumar from CSDS, was terribly interesting. That was the, the chapter by Rajendra Vora and, and Suhash Palshikar, who showed that in Maharashtra, Marathas have remained dominant in a very constant manner. You know, it, it, it's fascinating to see that uh, there is no decline of, of the Maratha domination uh, in, in, in the state assembly and in the government, uh, at least till, uh, till recently. Uh, now, what uh, we may need to do, and it's true for Marathas, it's true for Patels, it's true for Jats, we need to look at class within caste and see whether within this big, big uh, dominant caste, there is no differentiation, such a differentiation along socioeconomic lines that you may also have poor people among the dominant Marathas. And that's what I, I'm, I'm trying to do now. So I will, I will get back to you with, with new information when I'll get the results. Yeah, we have with us uh, Geetika. Geetika from uh, Assam University. She is pursuing her PhD. Geetika, you can unmute and ask. Are you there? Yeah, uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, we will come back to Geetika. We, we have uh, Professor uh, Swaruparani uh, from uh, uh, University of Hyderabad, who was also uh, active, who is being uh, active in Bahujan politics uh, and also taught. Uh, teaches us in University of Hyderabad on uh, Dalit politics and Bahujan politics. So over to uh, Professor Swaruparani. It's nice uh, listening to you, Christopher Jafalot. 
uh, this is the first time I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, being uh, uh, contacting you and listening to you. And uh, since uh, you know, almost 30 years, I have been, I have been uh, uh, with the Dalit movement and Bhojan movement mostly. And uh, I read a lot. I teach, I use your uh, books for references. And uh, I really appreciate your scholarship and commitment uh, to the cause of uh, the uh, OBCs. And I married an OBC person. And uh, because of, uh, as you said, you know, politics, uh, I wanted to ask you, there's, uh, in my 30 years of uh, experience teaching as well as uh, uh, participating in politics, Madhojan politics, especially OBCs. I have found OBCs. This is my, you know, uh, empirical uh, study I'm uh, discussing with you. OBCs, uh, in terms of political politics, uh, they are very excellent, uh, you know, in uh, giving the, delivering the goods in politics of India. But somehow, somehow they are not able to they are uh, what I should say, it, uh, bring in the different cl clusters together. And uh, in spite of having, uh, you know, uh, major, uh, you know, subdivisions within OBCs and uh, their contribution to Indian politics, whatever may be the party, their contribution to Indian politics is, uh, you know, significant in terms of financing the party participating in party activities and be dedicatedly working for the party, whatever may be the party, whether it is BJP, Congress, or any regional party, including Bhojan Smaj Party. And in Bhojan Smaj Party also, I found that uh, within, though we call it Bhojan politics, but there is a slight demarcation towards OBCs. As a scholar who is working for so many years on OBCs, what is your opinion on that? Because this question I'm raising, uh, uh, when we are talking about the Bahujan politics, when we have our own uh, Bahujan Smaj party, within the party also, there, is, there are, uh, uh, you know, individuals suffering just because they are obeses. This I'm uh, raising with a grief that uh, very recently, two years, two and a half years back, I lost my husband only because of politics, ethical, ethical politics, moral politics. It is very easy to idealize, very uh, flowery to explain, but in Indian context, an OBC coming out or taking about the Bhajan concept and the OBC concept, working with ethical, moral politics, it's very challenging. Very challenging and OBCs are suffering. So how you explain? I would like to know your opinion. It's, I'm, I'm feeling bad that I lost my husband, but at the same time, I have not lost my hope. I still would like to work for the OBCs, Bojans, and the SCs, SCs, because that's very hard. You know, it's dear to my heart. And I'm trained to, into politics by uh, Maniwar Kanshiram, sir. So therefore, my, my, you know, I, he was the one who got me married to an OBC, saying that in future politics, Indian politics, SCBC combination will create an, a remarkable political composition. So what's your opinion? Maybe I'm, I have given more personal uh, thing, but I'm very attached to it. As you are attached and you are studying as a scholar, I'm teaching as well as working, and this is my experience. Uh, okay, you know, I, 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 I still can... have a hope. And how you, uh, what way we can bring in a, a, a proper understanding, a proper cultural and uh, you said the uh, silent revolution. Silent revolution could create uh, a, a remarkable change. And what sort of silent revolution India need to have at this juncture of uh, time? I would like to know your opinion. 
Thank you. Well, I, I have only five minutes left because I have to move uh, to another uh, meeting, but uh, I'll try to do justice to the big questions you've just asked. Um, well, I do think that uh, OBCs have uh, not been as articulate, as sharp as the uh, Dalits have been because they missed a, a, an Ombed car, you know, he made such a huge difference. So that's, that's a major contrast. There is no sense of unity the way you can have on the Ambedkarites side, because you don't have the corpus, you don't have the uh, figure, the personality that could uh, um, embody the fight, embody the, uh, the battle, that's one. Secondly, the problem with OBCs, it's, that it's a very diverse category. It's, um, you know, Dalits are the ex untouchables. So there is a kind of red line. They've been separated from the rest for millennia, at least centuries. OBCs, you know, you can't say they are Shudras. They are not. Uh, the uh, Jats, uh, Marathas uh, are Shudras, but, uh, dominant caste. So in among the OBCs, you don't have this traditional um, legacy. Plus, and more importantly, the diversity between the the small ones, the poor ones, and the and the rich ones is huge. And and this, and last but not least, this diversity is is captured by the fact that one caste group may be OBC in one state and not an OBC in another state. And within the same state, you may be a Maratha or you may be a Maratha Kunbi. You know, you have shades of hierarchy. So the, for all these reasons, I think it was much more difficult for, for the OBCs to have a leader, to have an ideology, to have a sense of unity. But the fact that you have hope, uh, I think is <laughs> the most important one. It will, it will happen, it will, it will happen and, we'll, and we'll have other webinars. I'm sure Kiran will organize other webinars where we will share um, hope again. Kiran, yeah. I'd love to make a move as, as a grid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you take one final question, sir? Mm -hmm. I have only two minutes left. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah, Gitika, you can unmute and uh, ask. Gitika, are you there? Oh, she's not there. So, no problem. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah I will. OK. Hello, sir. Good up. Good evening, sir. So, yes. sir, my uh, my question is that the what uh, measure or what suggestion would you like to give to the student uh, who are enjoying OBC uh, this one reservation in Central University? Well, you know, the first thing students should do uh, would be to gather together the data that will help them to make their points because most of the time they don't have this information and therefore in any debate, in any uh, controversy even, um, they, they, have, they are on the losing side. Do build your case, do build your case properly. Essentially that's why Kiran does, <laughs> is very good at collecting data. Do that first and then build your case and uh, then you can uh, be um, on the same page with many people uh, for uh, at the university in the first place, not speak in the air, but speak on the basis of empirical data. Yeah, with this, with that note, uh, we'll build our case with uh, empirical <laughs> data, and that's what we are doing. And others also supporting us. We uh, without ma wasting much time, I thank uh, Professor Kisto uh, for uh, for empowering us, for uh, enlightening us in one way, uh, especially this younger generation, and. Uh, we are very thankful for you for giving uh, uh, your valuable time to us and uh, giving this wonderful uh, webinar. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you, Kiran. We'll do it again. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, uh, professors, media people, politicians, and uh, students, uh, even yeah, from the side of uh, uh, All India OBC. Coordination Committee and also All India OBC Students Association. We thank everyone for joining us. Uh, 
uh, please uh, like our page on Facebook and Twitter. It's uh, AIOBCSA. You can just type it and you can uh, uh, share our videos. Uh, join us if you are uh, students, you can join us, uh, raise your own issues. We have so many issues that are coming up. Um, and recently there is issue with uh, Central University of Punjab where uh, they're considering OBCs um, uh, who cleared their cutoff in general, uh, but they are confining to OBC. I, uh, they are doing with SCST also. So we are, uh, and the NEET issue is a big issue. NEET, uh, law universities issues, non-implementation of OBC. We have so many issues to fight at your uh, different levels, at state level, at your university level, at national level. We request everyone to uh, join uh, us and raise uh, different issues uh, at different platforms. Maybe you can also use digital platform to raise issues. So with this note, uh, uh, sir, uh, Sandeep sir, uh, can we close it? You want to speak something? I think you left. You can, uh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You can unmute. Yeah. Yeah, Kiran. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to. I would like to thank uh, Christoph, sir. Uh, basically, uh, uh, that was he was very nice. Uh, I I just I'm showing this book, uh, India's Silent Revolution: uh, uh, The Rise of the Low Caste in North Indian Politics. Actually, this is the Bible for the OBCs and the Dalits also. So I would request all the people who are interested into OBC discourse. They must buy and read this book. And this has been uh, written, this has been uh, produced by, uh, by a hard work, uh, which was done day in, day out by Professor Christophe Jeffrelot. And I'm surprised by his uh, hard work. Um, you know, uh, a day ago, he would be in Paris, and the other day, he would be in London. And he would find him, I mean, you would find him uh, after two days, a couple of days in India. He, he worked so uh, hard for uh, the epistemic base of the OBCs and the Dalits from India. So I don't uh, take him, I don't consider him as a person, as a citizen of France, I take him as a citizen of the humanity. And I take him as a more true Indian than anyone else uh, in this uh, world. So he's a person who has truly, who has uh, objectively raised the issues of uh, discrimination to the poor of this country. He deserves not you know he we we love him uh, and that's uh, uh, actually he's a person uh, he has put in lots of labor uh, for the involvement of the uh, involvement of a poor country epistemically poor country like india pakistan and he has done a huge work i have read some of his articles i follow him he he uh, works so hard you know you can just have the glimpse of his study room from where he was he speaking to us uh, it is full of books data is here and there. And uh, you, you can just imagine whenever we request him, I requested him personally, he said that you collaborate with Kiran and uh, organize that le lecture. We did it, we would, when he comes to Delhi, I would, uh, you know, uh, organize a, uh, a program where we would felicitate him. He deserves our felicitation. We would honor him because he's a person who has worked for the uh, poor, uh, poor of the country tirelessly raising all the in important issues. So he is a true human being who is not of France, but of more than, I mean, but, but, but of... Uh, for your uh, selfless uh, research work and uh, your love to us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kiran, for organizing a very, uh, very important program. And thank you all who joined this program and uh, make it a great success. Uh, we, we have recorded it. We would put it on uh, like YouTube and other uh, important uh, uh, places where you can have access of it. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Kiran. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll close this session. I think Papu uh, Yadav, sir, you want to talk? Sorry, he's, he's, he left. He's, you're there? Hello. Go, sir. You can, oh, one minute, one minute, I will. Uh... Yeah, you can unmute. So, no, Nikranji, no, no mention, no mention. Uh, first, first of all, thank you very much for, for arranging very tremendous seminar. Really, I salute you. 
uh, uh, thank you also the sandeep sir uh, my uh, please uh, provide me the sandeep sir number uh, me uh, i want to yeah, talk uh, sandeep sir yeah we'll share we share thank you very much thank you very much yeah. next time i will uh, i, I have typed my number my... i typed my number in chat you kindly get it from there oh, okay sir okay thank you sir i think you also need some facebook page sir sandeep sir that the all india <laughs> obc coordination committee page maybe that will be useful for everyone to message you or uh, interact with you uh, we'll do it kiran 9350949678 thank you sir thank you thank you sandeep sir thank you all thank you kiran okay. we'll yeah, do yeah, it ha huh? yeah, yeah. mohammed danish you want to talk you want to speak you raise your hand okay he left so we'll close the meeting we will share this video to everyone uh, it will be available on facebook whatsapp uh, and also on uh, we will also share the link on uh, uh, twitter and you can also share it with your friends um, and in your circles thank you everyone okay thank you thank you thank you